Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, the changing of the guard. At the end of June, the 25 members of the UN Tax Committee will complete their terms of office and conclude one of the busiest times in tax history as nations work toward a global corporate tax overhaul. So what can be learned from the current committee's work over the last four years? Here to talk more about this is Tax Notes contributing editor Nana Ama Sarfo. Ama, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much, Dave. It's good to be back. So you've been following the UN Tax Committee for some time. What's your take on the significance of this committee change? Well, the tax committee's mandate is to address the tax needs of developing countries. And I think that this outgoing committee really set a precedent in terms of expanding the taxing rights of source countries, which are often developing countries. Their most publicized work was in the digital taxation space. Notably, they created a new treaty provision, Article 12b, which allows source taxing right over automated digital services. And they also pushed discussion forward on a proposal to tax software payments as royalties. But beyond that, they also approved a provision in the model convention allowing source countries to tax capital gains on offshore and direct transfers. And can you tell me about your guest and what you both discussed? Yes, I spoke with Rajat Bansal, who was an outgoing member of the tax committee, and he was a co-coordinator of the drafting group for Article 12b. So he came on the podcast in his personal capacity to talk about some of the committee's most important achievements over the past four years, including Article 12b, and he also shared some advice for the committee's incoming members. All right. Now, before we get started, I should note that this interview took place over Zoom from halfway across the world. So please excuse any audio issues you may hear. And now let's go to that interview. Mr. Bonsa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. First off, I have to say congratulations on concluding this latest session of the UN Tax Committee. This current committee over the past four years has introduced and negotiated some of the most publicized proposals in the committee's recent history, especially in the digital taxation area. So my first question for you is, what was the tax committee's mission over the past four years? And what would you say are the tax committee's main achievements? And also what projects are still pending? The tax committee is basically, its main mission is to update the UN model tax convention and to also update the manual for treaty negotiations. And basically, the mission of the tax committee is to work in the interest of developing countries in tax matters. It takes up other works besides the UN model tax convention, for example, the updation of the UN. United Nations the Transfer Pricing Manual or the Handbook on Disputes Resolution is a new addition to its work. So those are the, uh, I would say, we cannot call it mission, but that's what this com- this committee over the past four years has been doing. Now coming to its achievements, uh, I think uh, the committee has done work on a variety of areas and uh, all of them are very important. But for me, the most important works are those where the committee has uh, paid attention to al- increasing allocation of taxing rights to the developing countries or the source countries. So the main achievements in that respect, we can, call, we can say are the digital economy taxation, the provision on offshore indirect transfers, the matters relating to taxation of software payments as royalties, and also I would say the guidance on uh, dispute resolution in the new UN handbook and the UN transfer pricing manual is very important. Those are also its main achievements. Project spending, now uh, every membership lays down its own agenda but uh, there is always a carryover from the previous membership. And for this membership, software payments related issue is uh, one of the most important issues, uh, which is going to the next membership. Besides that, uh, uh, in the model updation, quite a few areas have been identified. And those are uh, by this membership, but it's up to the next membership to decide whether they want to go on with them and new projects will be added to that. So that's about it. 
Wonderful. Well, I mean, as you had mentioned, this was an extremely busy session and increasing the allocation of taxing rights to developing countries featured so prominently. And along those lines, I would like to discuss Article 12B for a bit. So in April, the tax committee approved Article 12B to be added to the UN Model Tax Convention. And I would say that it's definitely the most discussed achievement by this current committee. And as you know, it has its supporters and then also its detractors. So for our listeners who are unfamiliar with 12B or perhaps need a refresher on what that proposal entails, could you briefly explain its main features? And could you also discuss what 12B means in terms of taxing digital companies and what it also means for governments? So... As you said, this is the most talked about achievement of this membership, Article 12B, for, uh, to, to address the tax challenges of digital economies. Now, uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that this is a solution uh, through tax treaties. It does not su- uh, suggest any taxation measure as such, but it is a kind of removal of an obstacle that is there in the tax treaties to tax the digital economies due to the permanent establishment rule in the tax treaties. And now, uh, what are its main features? This article is uh, basically dealing with automated digital services uh, taxation, which is one major component of the digital businesses services segment. And uh, then uh, in implementation terms, it offers two options. One is by way of withholding taxes and one is by way of net basis taxation. The, and the, it, it addresses the payments from the market jurisdictions and taxes on the basis of where the payments are made from. So uh, these are probably the most uh, prominent features of this article. And uh, the, another aspect is that this article or this insertion in the UN Model Tax Convention or the solution by the UN Tax Committee is kind of a standalone solution to this problem. It's not combining any other problem with this and it's confining itself, uh, UN Tax Committee has confined itself to this particular problem only. And uh, in what it means in terms of taxing digital companies Now, one aspect is that taxation is only possible when there is a provision in the domestic law. That's important to understand. Then it is kind of a traditional way, the way we have been doing so far, the world has been doing so far, taxation of multinational enterprises or cross-border tax transactions uh, through the, uh, I mean, the system where there is a foreign enterprise, then its income in that country is determined by that country and it is taxed. It's not a major deviation in that sense. So I think that this is something where developing countries will be at ease to continue the same system of taxation. And uh, also the taxation incidence in this proposal is quite reasonable and fair. I mean, three to 4% withholding tax or net basis taxation if there is a loss so or a loss or lesser profit or maybe uh, whatever is the choice of the enterprise but what it means for governments governments will need to amend their treaties to implement this and possibly a swift way to could be to have a multilateral instrument to amend the treaties together and uh, one aspect is what would be its interaction with unilateral measures. Now, unilateral measures, uh, probably I'll uh, I'll leave it at this because uh, uh, we are talking at the moment about the features of uh, Article 12b. Thank you for bringing up unilateral measures because I do have a follow-up question about those actually. So as you very well know, right now, several countries are choosing to enact their own unilateral digital services taxes. And a huge question is what will happen to those measures, presuming that the OECD's International Tax Reform Project is approved. 
So some countries have promised to rescind their DSTs if there's an OECD solution, and some have remained silent on the issue. And I know that some within the international tax community have argued that 12B could essentially give developing countries permission to enact unilateral measures. So I'm interested in hearing your response to that argument. And also, what effect do you think that 12B will have on unilateral measures? No, um, the, if one looks at it, the kind of uh, income covered under 12B is similar to the digital service taxes or equalization levies uh, that is uh, enacted by several countries, both developing and developed. Now, uh, from that point of view, I think it will be it, it would be very much possible to cover those measures through Article 12B, uh, and uh, if those taxes can be covered under the tax treaty by remodeling them in some manner, then this problem of unilateral measures may be solved. That's my impression. And it would uh, one major criticism to unilateral measures is that they do not allow uh, elimination of double taxation or for allowance of foreign tax credit. Now, once the, uh, the these taxes are covered under the tax treaty, then uh, the double taxation issue will be addressed and the foreign tax credit will be granted. Now, uh, the what you mentioned that uh, this uh, Article 12B will will prompt the developing countries to have more unilateral measures is not very clear to me because according to me, it shouldn't happen this way. Rather, wherever there is a unilateral measure and a tax treaty provision is brought in, then the reason to keep the DST or equalization levy outside the tax treaty will vanish. And there will be an incentive to cover it under the tax treaty and align it with the tax treaty. And uh, that should work fine, according to me. I see. That is very, very helpful, very illuminating. So thank you for that explanation. Now, I think it's also important to note that several tax committee members did not think that 12B should be enacted. They had several concerns about its design and how the provision might intersect with the OECD's process. So it was very clear to me from the outside looking in that this was not an easy provision to negotiate or get approved at all. And so I'm wondering if you can discuss with us two things. First, the challenges in drafting and negotiating 12B. And then secondly, what ultimately tipped the scales in favor of adoption? You are absolutely right that it wasn't easy. And uh, since UN Tax Committee is an open forum, which is attended by uh, by the civil society as well as observers. So, I mean, uh, they can all, uh, all endorse this very well. And uh, now, to, uh, it'll be, I mean, it will not be possible in this short time to describe all that happened in the process of drafting and negotiating Article 12B. Uh, but I will definitely summarize. So, uh, you, you know, there was uh, this, this committee membership decided to take up the issue of tax challenges of digital economy right in 2017. And initially, there was, uh, a, uh, there was debate for quite some time whether this committee should do anything more than observing what's happening in other forums. The reason given was that it should be it shouldn't be duplication of work so some of us from uh, mainly the developing country members uh, uh, were of the view that we should look at it from the point of view of developing countries in terms of complexity as well as the share of revenue that will be uh, assigned to the uh, market jurisdictions or source countries which are developing countries and uh, we felt that uh, there was a, it was necessary to start working independently and uh, because uh, the by studying the proposal elsewhere it wasn't appearing that uh, i mean it may, one doesn't know what will be the ultimate uh, outcome there but certainly losing time was not advisable so we we proposed and it was agreed that the committee should work independently now how it work independently was an issue 
because members were from both developed and developing countries and many of them were opposed. So a proposal was made that members should be allowed to give their own proposal, which can then be discussed by the committee. And we worked that way. If proposals were made by some of us, like myself and one Mr. Troya, and then the committee took up those proposals and it was agreed that a drafting group should be formed to work on those proposals further. And that's how Article 12B was born. And uh, we continued, uh, we prepared its text, we prepared its commentary full entirely on our own. The major, uh, I, would, I should say, a major milestone was when the proposal was published in the public domain in August 2020, because then it was before the world and everybody came to know that this is how, the, what is what exactly is proposed. I would give credit to the secretariat as well as the co-coordinators of the com subcommittee who worked and uh, that, 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 that changed the situation quite a bit. And thereafter, it was refinement and multiple rounds of discussions. Uh, you might be knowing that the um, outside organizations, observers supported it. And besides them, the World Bank staff and the IMF staff also supported the Article 12B almost entirely. So uh, these were the uh, steps. And finally, I would say once it was uh, before the whole world, that tipped the scales in favor of adopting it. And then a vote was taken, the committee voted by majority to adopt it. And finally, its uh, final version was adopted in the 22nd session recently in uh, April 21, uh, last month, the month before last. So this is what, in short, is the journey of Article 12B. I hope I have been able to summarize it. Absolutely. What a process. And I must say, what a very expedited process. I think, as I said, looking from the outside in, it's really impressive to see how the committee was able to draft and then approve this proposal in such a short amount of time. Yeah. And let me say that this is entirely an in-house product. And that makes it all the more impressive. So congratulations again on getting that approved and approving its insertion within the UN Model Tax Convention. Now, turning our attention to another proposal that you had mentioned, the proposal addressing the taxation of offshore indirect transfers. Could you please give our listeners some background on that proposal and what it sought to achieve and also why it is so important for developing countries? Offshore indirect transfers are, uh, uh, in tax world, they are well known. And uh, quite a few cases, uh, famous cases are there all around the world where uh, the matters went into arbitration and uh, some small countries uh, uh, had to, um, liabilities equivalent to the, the, I mean, comparable to their total income over the year or gross domestic product. So these are, uh, these are important from the point of revenue. And basically it means that uh, where the value is derived from the market, from, the, uh, from a country and the transfer of value is done through a, a structure, a legal structure where another company holding the shares of local company which holds the assets are transferred and taxation in the country where assets are situated which resulted in value appreciation is not possible due to the rules and laws. So uh, even if a country uh, enacts domestic law to tax such transactions due to the tax treaties it is not possible to tax treaties come in the way and maybe it's not possible to tax them. So this time the UN tax committee has inserted a provision in the capital gains article where, uh, which, is to tax, which is to address the offshore indirect transfer cases and tax treaty also will be permitting them now. 
So this is quite important because of the amounts involved and already so many cases, quite a few cases around the world on this issue. Wow, very interesting. And thank you for that overview. Now, I wanted to focus our conversation on the future and some proposals that might reappear before the committee. Earlier, you had mentioned the software as royalties proposal. And although 12B attracted the lion's share of public attention, the software proposal generated a lot of feedback from the tax and tech communities. So what is the status on the software as royalties proposal? Software royalties proposal is an offshoot from the previous membership and has been continuing for some time. Now, uh, there is already a minority view in the uh, UN, tax, uh, UN Model Tax Convention commentary on the software. Now, uh, this time, uh, firstly, we, there was, uh, continuing from the earlier work, uh, the, some of us wanted to expand that minority view and also propose to remove the controversy relating to payments in respect of copyrights versus copyrighted article by including software payments themselves as royalties. So that was the proposal, but it could not get approved in this membership finally, though we have expanded the minority view in this regard. And I would consider that also a good progress with an assurance that this work will be continued by the next membership. So uh, th this, this is also a very important work area and according to me, one of the most important work areas which the new membership should take into account. Right, so how likely is it that the new committee could continue work on this particular issue? I mean, especially given its importance as you had mentioned. So uh, I was saying that uh, the uh, new membership would definitely take it up. Although what will be the outcome of this particular issue is something uh, uh, that's uncertain. Reason is that there was quite a bit of division in opinion in the present membership and in the previous memberships also. But I would say this committee made tremendous progress on this issue and the insertion of minority view is also quite a significant development because now at least there is a view available in the commentary on uh, the, by to, to countries using the UN model to, to tax the software payments themselves as royalties. So to, to answer your question, what will happen in the next membership? Uh, it's difficult to predict, but, uh, but we hope that some sometime there will be a solution to this issue as well. Well, we at Tax Notes will definitely be keeping an eye on any potential developments. So thank you for that explanation. Now, I think it's fair to say that over the coming months and years, there likely will be more attention and scrutiny on the tax committee and the work that it does on behalf of developing countries. And I think that will be true partly because of the precedent that's been set by this committee and partly because of the general direction that international tax reform seems to be heading, particularly the perception that developing countries won't benefit greatly. So through that lens, what do you think can be done to make the tax committee an even better advocate for developing countries? That's a very, very, uh, I, I think very relevant uh, question and something uh, we, we should try to address. Now, firstly, I would say that it, since these committees work for a fixed lifetime, that is four years, uh, unlike other organizations which are working on tax matters, international organizations where there is continuity, it's only a fixed time of four years. Now, it's very important to lay down the agenda for four year term carefully, because once the agenda is laid down in the beginning, then the committee keeps working on that. And it's very difficult to shift path after you have started. Uh, when I joined as a member for, for the first time I visited the committee, I had never been to this committee before, even as an observer. So uh, 
it takes time to realize what's happening and therefore i would say that agenda setting is very important i had i made a suggestion in the this uh, committee that agenda inputs can be taken from developing countries from various stakeholders and uh, beforehand and so that a meaningful agenda in the interest of developing countries can be laid down then next point i would say is selection of members is very important because the members should be such who are committed to this cause of working in the interest of developing countries uh, the work of the committee is the output of members so they should be uh, having good technical expertise and commitment to the cause of working for the interest of developing countries now another point would be uh, about the implementation of the output of the committee uh, there i mean the committee does its work it's there now can it be sent to can it be projected or canvas to the developing countries for whom it is meant is something that that i have been thinking about uh, so probably if that is done then committee not exactly the committee but at least the ecosoc or the body which is uh, which uh, uh, which is the uh, tax committee is subsidiary body of the un bodies so they can probably think about it this just loud thinking on my part so this is another aspect i think can make tax committee a better advocate for developing countries all very interesting points thank you for those and to close along those lines what advice do you have for the incoming committee members okay I, i actually i am no one to suggest to them they are all independent people but one thing i would say is that this committee's mandate is to work in the interest of developing countries and so be the, the whichever country they are from that objective should be kept in mind once they have joined the committee and uh, the, i think that's very important and uh now another uh, some uh, some issue other uh, suggestions i would make are for example uh, the committee meets only twice in a year and it uh, the work goes on throughout the year so if the members uh, ca- the time in between the two meetings is important and uh, during that also if they can find ways and means to i i'm sure already the members do but i am just suggesting to the new for for in, in general that they can do that as well and uh, it, it's necessary to prioritize items because the committee works on host of issues a very wide range of issues so uh, which issues should be devoted more time in terms and prioritizing them uh, is important for the members and so these these are some of the suggestions that come to my mind for uh, the new members wonderful well mr bantal i hope that you have a long vacation planned after all of this i know that this has been a very momentous and important four years for you and the tax committee and all the work that you have done so i just thank you so much for coming on the podcast and explaining all of the important developments for us and you know giving us some feedback on what we should be looking at in the future so again thank you so much for your time and we thank you so much for coming on the podcast thank you very much ms nana for giving this me giving me this opportunity to uh, to share these views thank you very much and now coming attractions each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines joining me now is acquisitions and engagement editor in chief page jones page what do you have for us thanks dave in tax notes federal william kale and claire haldeman examine avenues for business tax policy Two practitioners urge the IRS to issue guidance on when an acquisitive reverse triangular merger triggers a recapitalization. In Tax Note State, Lynn Gandhi examines primary rules of statutory interpretation. Three Evershed Sutherland practitioners examine factors that influence a finding of work product waiver. In Tax Notes International, three practitioners with EY analyze the OECD's transfer pricing guidelines on the remuneration due to service providers. 
Two KPMG practitioners examined the blocked income problem in the 1994 U.S. transfer pricing regulations. On the opinions page, Robert Goulder examines the applicability of foreign and religious law in federal estate tax litigation. Marie Sapiri suggests that a first-time abatement policy for late filers of Form 3520 who owe no tax might be the ideal way to encourage voluntary compliance in the long run. And finally, the submissions period for the Christopher E. Bergen Award for Excellence in Writing will be closing soon. This annual award recognizes superior student writing on unsettled questions in tax law or policy. Eligible students must be enrolled in an accredited undergraduate or graduate program during the academic year. Submissions are due by June 30th, 2021. Visit taxnotes.com students for more details. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at taxstew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at taxnotes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Analyst Inc. does not provide tax advice or tax preparation services. Nothing in the podcast constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice. A full disclaimer is included in the transcript.